We spend a lot of time on this channel discussing the various uses of artificial intelligence. Some of these uses are good, some of them are bad, but most of them lie in this gray area where they can have positive applications but also are ripe for misuse. On one hand, new technology often provides us with opportunities to create safer, more efficient societies that benefit more people. But on the other hand, they can also influence and perpetuate power disparities that make marginalized communities even more marginalized. In particular, the use of artificial intelligence for surveillance is an undoubtedly contentious topic that many cities and towns are being forced to reckon with right now. I have my own opinions on this as a person of color and as someone who lives in a city that has chosen to ban the use of facial recognition by local governments, and I would love to hear yours in the comments. That said, I thought that this video would be an opportunity to talk to someone who's an expert on this topic. Kate Crawford, the director of the Technology for Liberty program at the ACLU of Massachusetts. I've included some excerpts from our conversation in this video, and we'll also be posting the full interview on this channel. You can find the link in the description box below. To talk about AI-based surveillance, it's helpful to start by talking about surveillance. It's important to note that when we talk about surveillance today, and especially in this video, we're often referring to surveillance states or societies where everyone is being surveilled at all times, but surveillance can be of one or more people. Governments or institutions of power have in some form wanted the ability to track their citizens for as long as they've been around. And this isn't always for negative reasons. During pandemics, it's helpful to know who is sick and where they've been so that you can control the spread of an outbreak. When surveillance was used for less humanitarian reasons, leaders might enlist spies to follow a person of interest or a group. In fact, our concerns around surveillance are often reflected in our media and in our literature. My first encounter with the idea of a surveillance state was when I read George Orwell's 1984 as a kid. And even without modern technologies such as artificial intelligence, you don't have to look that far back into history to see where surveillance can go wrong or be used for malicious purposes. One current example of that is surveillance in China. While China has adopted a lot of AI-based systems in order to keep track of its population, things like facial recognition are now fairly common there, it has long tracked its minority Muslim population over concerns surrounding overthrowing governments and terrorism. Now, this is aided by the fact that the Chinese government has a lot more control over digital information, where it goes, who gets it, than you'd see in somewhere like the United States. And while they now use AI to aid in their surveillance, China has been keeping track of people without AI for years, often using that information to detain minorities in detention camps. You know, police officers and police agencies are um, the former human beings and the latter composed of human beings who are just as prone to abuse, error, mistake, um, errors of judgment as anybody else. Um, we know that any surveillance system, any database system that government entities create or give themselves access to is ultimately abused. So whether that's at the federal level with something like the National Security Agency's um, quote unquote foreign intelligence surveillance, which swept up the private communications of millions of Americans, uh, being used by NSA analysts to spy on their romantic interests, or whether we're talking about local police um, misusing their access to criminal databases to look for information about um, people they have a personal vendetta against, maybe a neighbor who's, um, you know, won't stop bothering them about shoveling the sidewalk, or <laughs> um, even in potentially political situations, uh, using information that is supposed to be deployed only for official public safety purposes for personal or political purposes. And that, there's, a, there's a long history of that in the United States, which extends into the present. And when you add modern technology, such as AI, to the equation, you might see how people become concerned, especially considering that modern surveillance often relies on biometric features, things like your face or your fingerprints or your gait, things you can't leave at home. As uh, Somerville City Councilor Ben Ewan Campen, who's the champion of the ban in that city, has said repeatedly when he talks about this, uh, this technology essentially is the equivalent of the government requiring everyone to tattoo their name and social security number on their face and walk around like that um, 
so that the government can track everywhere everyone's going all the time and what everyone is doing all the time. Now, that's kind of the rationale for using an AI-based system, right? The idea, at least from the perspective of someone in government or law enforcement, would be that biometric identifiers are much harder to hide, especially since there are security cameras pretty much everywhere. Based on that, it should be easier to catch wanted criminals, minimizing the risk of everyone around them. Now, I reached out to both the Massachusetts State Police and the Boston Police about this and didn't receive a reply, so I asked Kate about it. I can imagine based on some um, public statements that police officials and prosecutor types have made um, that they think this technology is helpful in at least a couple different ways. One um, is to identify people in images who may be unknown to them. So uh, if they have, you know, a video from a, uh, of a crime taking place on the street, they can potentially uh, crop an image of the person's face who's the suspect in that crime and then run that image um, against a database of known persons like a state driver's license database, state ID database, or a mugshot database to try to identify a suspect in a crime. So that's one way. And then there's another way, which is um, governments can use this technology in concert with surveillance camera networks that increasingly exist all over the country. and you know, that has a variety of uses for uh, state security agencies, enabling them to uh, find out where a pesky activist or journalist has been going, um, or to, to do things that people might think are more legitimate, like to um, identify somebody who's the subject of a warrant. But how does this newfangled AI-based surveillance work? Well, it can work in a lot of different ways, and not all of them rely on artificial intelligence. For example, most smartphones have location features enabled at all times. Even if you've disabled it for specific apps, your cell phone provider typically knows where you are at any given moment. You can turn this off for the record. And this location data can be used to track you without any sort of fancy algorithmic inference. If we're looking at AI-based surveillance systems, we're often talking about facial recognition. This can be anything from the kiosks at Boston Logan, which take a picture of you upon your return from an international trip and compare it against the photos existing in the federal database, to identifying a person from security camera footage. I'll note that the last Latter task is a lot harder than the former. The images that the federal government typically has access to, things like driver's license photos, passport photos, mugshots if you've been arrested, are all taken in a similar fashion. Squared shoulders look directly at the camera, bright lights, and no smile. In contrast, security camera footage can catch you in any position at any time with any expression on your face. And this is much harder to map back to you. Harder but not impossible. And I've included a link to a bunch of papers on papers with code that focus on this task, which is called person re-identification. You can't leave your face at home. Uh, yeah. you can leave your home. <laughs> so in some ways, um, the privacy concerns are heightened actually with biometric surveillance because, mm -hmm. you know, and not, not just with respect to facial surveillance either, but there are a whole host of other like remote biometrics that can, can be marshaled to track people um, without their knowledge or consent. The shape of your ear is supposedly a biometric, um, your voice, right? Uh, the way that you walk, your gait is also supposedly a unique identifier. So those types of bodily um, biometric surveillance technologies, I would argue are actually more invasive than cell phone mm -hmm. tracking because you can't take them off, right? <laughs> you can't just leave yeah. it at home. Um, the other difference, which sort of cuts in the other direction, is that whereas with our cell phones, they're in our pockets all the time, um, although we could leave them at home, most of us don't, the networks of surveillance cameras across Massachusetts, you know, most of the country, frankly, most of the world at this point, may not be so pervasive that they can see every city block throughout an entire community, but that's changing, um, you know, Every day, frankly, every month, every year, dozens more surveillance cameras are added to the city streets of Boston. Um, and those surveillance networks are growing more and more powerful. And so, you know, if, if we end up in a situation where there is a surveillance camera every other block, it is going to become almost identical to uh, cell phone surveillance because of just the pervasive nature 
of the tracking. Additionally, there are still concerns around the use of AI-based surveillance for marginalized populations. For example, facial recognition technology is still shown to perform worse on people of color than it does on white people. In this scenario, an innocent person might be misidentified as a criminal for a crime that they did not commit. So we know there are these cameras everywhere, and we know that using AI systems, it's possible at least to track people wherever they go. One big question that I had because of that is whether or not we really have a right to privacy and whether these systems infringe upon that right. Like many people, I'd heard that once you go out in public, you essentially lose your right to privacy. And so any sort of information that's captured on a security camera or something like that is open for the taking. I asked Cade to learn more. About two years ago, there was a case uh, decided at the Supreme Court called Carpenter versus United States. It's an ACLU case that dealt with um, cell phone tracking. They were obtaining those, th those data without warrants for a long time until the ACLU brought this case to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled in a very important ruling, Carpenter versus US uh, in the summer of 2018, that in fact, police do have to get a warrant to obtain that information. In that decision, which was written by Chief Justice John Roberts, he says, Contrary to law enforcement's argument that we lose our right to privacy when we walk outside, we retain a right to privacy in public, he said. And the critical difference between, you know, maybe 40 years ago or 50 years ago when, you know, I don't think anybody would have said government entities would have had to get a warrant to physically follow someone walking down the street. The introduction of new technologies like cell phones in this case enable government entities to do things that they've never been able to do before. So in response to some of the concerns that I mentioned in this video, some cities have begun to ban the use of facial recognition by local governments. What this often means is that the local police cannot use facial recognition to track or identify people. However, if you go to an airport such as San Francisco or Boston's, you will still encounter facial recognitions that is a federal system. I talked to Kate about these bans and what they mean for state and federal level regulation. So I think it's a good thing from a policy perspective that the uh, law on this issue is, uh, is trickling up instead of the other way around. Um, what we're seeing is, you know, communities, especially the first two cities in the country, San Francisco first and then Somerville shortly after that, uh, to do this, the, the real significance of those two doing this first is that those are two places that are home to lots of tech workers. These communities are saying, you know what, we are not actually going to allow the technology to determine the boundaries of our freedoms in the 21st century. We live in a democracy and so we are going to decide. We're not going to let the mere existence of this technology steamroll our rights. Um, and that's really exciting for me because it's a uh, it's a kind of like creative intervention, getting people to think differently about not just this particular technology, but about technology writ large and how, you know, a variety of systems that are um, controlled by centralized, very powerful actors are being used to undermine our democratic uh, rights and our individual interests. Lastly, we talked about what the average person might do to educate themselves, protect themselves, and support people who are working to make sure that surveillance technology is deployed as safely as possible. These are not actually that complicated of problems mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, thinking through what appropriate regulations might look like if we think regulation is appropriate or prohibiting uh, the government from using these technologies at all in certain contexts if we think that's appropriate. The, the debate about what ought to be done is not particularly complex. I think it's a conversation that any person um, in the United States can engage in. The real issue is, can we build the political movement and can we build the political will to force our lawmakers to do what benefits the public's interest instead of what benefits, um, frankly, the police or companies like Amazon? So personally, I can see where some of these AI-based surveillance systems could be useful and might have a positive impact if deployed with ethical guidelines in mind. I don't love waiting through long lines at the airport. I have TSA pre-check, so I know that the government is 
always tracking me on some level because they have my fingerprints and my facial recognition information. And personally, I don't mind that. However, especially as a person of color, I am concerned that these systems will be used to exacerbate existing inequalities and widen the divide between marginalized communities and law enforcement. I'm particularly concerned because companies that are touting the effectiveness and accuracies of these technologies are often making somewhat false claims or maybe not completely truthful claims about how accurate their technology is and law enforcement and government agencies aren't necessarily going to researchers to figure out whether or not these technologies are as good as the companies say they are. A common argument that I hear in favor of surveillance is that if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. I think that that argument's a little bit disingenuous. Just because I haven't done anything illegal recently doesn't mean that I want someone watching everything that I do. But I'm definitely interested in seeing where this goes. As Cade mentioned, many of these bans have come from technology-focused communities, and the people who live there likely have a better understanding of these technologies, both what they excel at, but also where they fail. In fact, New York City has recently put out a call for a chief algorithms officer, someone whose job it would be to make sure that systems like this are deployed ideally ethically. But if this goes anything like when companies tried to create ethics boards for their AI development, I think we still have a lot of work to do. Again, if you'd like to watch my full interview with Kate, and I highly recommend it, she's a really awesome person doing a lot of really interesting work, and we talked about so much stuff that I just wasn't able to fit into this video because I didn't want it to be 40 minutes long. You can check that out. I will link it up here, and it's also in the description box, and it's also just like on my channel, so it'll show up in your subscription box. And you can also find all my sources at the bottom of the video in the sources section where they always are. If you like this video, you can let me know by subscribing to my channel and smashing that like button. You can also support me on Patreon. Thank you so much to all of my current wonderful patrons. Otherwise, you can find me on the social medias, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.